WTBQ. Good afternoon. This is Tony Abatini coming from WTBQ Radio in New York, and this is Game On, the only national sports chalk radio show. Today's topic, we're back talking about the greatest game on this side of the Mississippi River, Northeast Travel Softball. We are privileged to have, well, one of them actually is one of the titans of the game, right? Um, When you talk about travel softball, Rick Way, who is the head coach of the Newtown Rock 18-goal team, a veteran, a warrior at the travel team level, 24 years of of coaching, actually played the game at the highest level on the men's league before the Newtown Rocks, right, was at the helm for the North Hampton Rebels and also the Blazing Angels. Any girls that are getting an opportunity to play in the Mid-Atlantic and beyond, um, it's usually through the Newtown Rock program. Rick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tony. And right next to Rick, we've got Stacy Pelez. When you talk about Ithaca softball, uh, uh, Stacy was a four-year starter, captain. She was all-world, up for the Bombers, went from player to graduate assistant coach. She is now uh, not living in Orange County, but living near the Orange County area. Stacy takes over from Laura Taylor, who's now at Jacksonville University, as the director of softball operations at the Rock Sports Park. Stacy, welcome to Game On. Very happy to be here. Let's get right into, and we're going to talk travel softball, Rick. Um, A lot of the parents who listen to the show, what advice can you start out in in giving them, getting them to understand the difference between local travel and and certainly gold? I know Tim Walton, when he was on the show a few weeks ago, really talked about gold and how that term is thrown around so loosely. But let's say, example, for example, you've got a 13 or 14-year-old daughter that has some talent. When do you start deciding that the local level might not be the best fit for her? Well, Tony, that's a good question today. In travel ball, um, the dynamics have changed. When we started like in the 90s, um, travel softball kind of was independent. There were as many teams as there are today. And as um, we moved into 2000, where we are today, there's so many different teams. There's almost Honestly, there's too many teams. And I think what a player of that young age has to do is find the right team, a team that is well coached. I don't think travel, as far as put a travel label on it where they have to travel all over the country, is a criteria. Just make sure you have a good base of good coaching. Find a team that competes every weekend. And um, honestly, in the travel world world today, for me and my older girls, we have like a balance in everything we do. Let's not get uh, to a travel team where it's every weekend. you got to have some time where you train, some time where you prepare, and then play a competitive schedule. And, and you know what, Rick, I, I think you're right, and, and balance seems to be the operative word. Stacy, growing up, right, you played for the Hudson Valley Express, certainly not a gold-level national team, and that's not a knock on the Express. That's just the reality of it. Um, how often were you practicing? Because w- when, you, when you talk and go back to girls that have had success at the college level, certainly like you have, how much was it? How much time did you put in when it was in softball season? Um, It's actually kind of funny because I started uh, with the whole travel softball world a little late. So I came on kind of mid-season about two times a week. We were, um, I mean, I was an hour away from where I needed to be for practice. We had girls coming in from all over the place. So our practices were never everybody there together. So it's kind of who, who can come when. So that's why we had it two nights a week that way. The girls that couldn't come maybe Tuesday were able to be there on Thursday to try to alleviate some of the travel time and the cost of traveling to practices. So, Yeah, you look at some of the, the truly premier goal teams, Rick, mm-hmm. the, the commitment level. and It's kind of a catch-22. Hey, we don't want you to spend all this time on practice and training. But you know what? At the end of the day, if you're going to go play at Alabama, Florida, and, and, and or somewhere in the Pac-10, you need to practice and, and almost – 12 months out of the year, commit to the game. And, and I, I think that's where some girls don't realize the amount of time that it takes, whether it's training, strength and conditioning, speed, mental skills training. We talked with Alan Jaeger a few weeks ago of the, of the importance of, of, of finding time to in, improve your relaxation and concentration skills, knowing that at the highest level, and we'll call goal level softball high level, how much of the game is mental? Oh, it's, if, in percentages, what number would you throw out? Boy, I think the mental part of the game today, it's 70% at least. I mean, Tony, it's really changed. I mean, we, 
everybody comes competitive today, especially the era we're in right now as far as athletically we can compete, we can play, they're well trained. A lot of them seek outside individual trainers. For me, the mental approach of the game is critical. I can't tell you how many times we'll play a, a team that could be better than us or, a, or somebody. Um, we get in a situation where the mental part of the game, preparation, understanding the moment, and um, they struggle with that. The mental part of the game is very important today. It's, it's probably the biggest, the most frustrating thing for me today is having my girls who are talented enough understand that you can compete at this level and have the mental approach to compete at that level. It's, it's one of the toughest things as a travel coach right now, getting – my players understand that. Stacy, I, I know with the younger girls, and um, we have, and certainly in, in our Orange County location, our Brain Day workshops, I know you've been a big supporter um, of, at a very early age, teaching 10, 11, 12-year-olds the importance of the flush. Jessica Mendoza was nice enough to introduce us to the toilet five, six years ago, and you'll see Stacy uh, in an afternoon having her little miniature toilet out there, Rick, and, and teaching the pitchers. Actually, there it is right now. I brought one in studio a few months ago. Um, as silly as it is, and it always garnishes a smile and a chuckle, but to get at a very early age these young softball players to learn how to let go Right. To, you know, we, we hear all the time from the sports psychologists about playing in the moment and, and releasing or whatnot. If you don't practice that, if that does not become part of your training routine, your ability to forget about it, as we say, at come game time, isn't going to happen. I mean, Rick said 70 percent. Stacy, if you had to put a percentage number on it, agree, disagree, less, more. Uh, I think with that, I'm going to quote my good friend Yogi Berra and say that 90 percent of the game is half mental. I think you're both wrong, actually. I'm going to say it's about 95%. 90%. And what's interesting, whether I'm right, Rick's right, or you're right, the question becomes, in the typical team practice or team training, and we know the difference between team practice and training, how much time is spent on what we're saying is at least a majority point of view. Let me answer for you. It's zero to 5%. And I think as coaches, we all realize this is important stuff, yet at the same time, how much are we devoting to, I call it the holy grail. And, and that seems to be the tough part. And, and not that we're sports psychologists. I know, well, again, Alan Jager, who was on a few weeks ago, he and I talked about um, what goes on at the major league level, some of the consulting work that I've done for major league teams in the, in the way of mental training. As a travel team coach, Rick, you have to at least try right, to teach relaxation understanding concentration, um, self-talk, affirmations, the, the building of a routine, um, a phenomenon that we see over and over again, and I want to get your input on it, white line fever. That swing that we saw before the game, look at how good that pitching delivery is in the bullpen. We cross that white line, and all of a sudden, the proverbial deer in the headlights, the adrenaline rush comes, and that girl that we said had the chance to play somewhere at a higher level, she looks like a train wreck. Rick, it's uh, fear, and you know, it's, let's go back to the mental part, Tony. You talk about fear. I talk about, I tell my girls all the time, all the time, how come we're not allowed to fail? And continuously, the girls consider it's 100% got to be successful. I said, girls, you're allowed to fail. There's a mental approach. How do you come back from failing? Like you said, the white line fever. Get in that box. They don't prep themselves as far as preparing to climb in that box one on one. They get in there, and all of a sudden, the audience changes. It's you and the pitcher. You get that tunnel vision, and you struggle. And and that's a big factor. We recently were down in a tournament in Florida where we faced, a, I thought, a decent pitcher, not, not better than the one we faced the night before, but just throwing a rise ball into the mix, our whole mental approach to hitting change, we look like we never hit, picked up a bat in our life. And that's the frustration that you, you, it's a frustration level crossing into that, getting between the white lines, climbing into that box and understanding how do I approach, how do I understand what I have to do. And we're so young. I mean, I have 18-year-olds, six. They're still young and understanding how to play this game and, the, and their approach to getting in there, understanding what they have to do to be successful. You have to teach that. You're, I, you know, I agree. 90 percent right, Stacy. We're all in the, we're all in the same area. That's a frustration level with me. Um, they're understanding what it takes to be successful, and it's mental. They all have the physical tools. And, and also, Tony, how do we come back when we fail? Well, I think that's the point where, and and this is why, in my humble opinion. Softball, baseball, by far the, the most difficult sport to play because of the emotional management of it. It's a game of failure. And, and we, we, know the st we know the stats 70% of the time we're going to fail as a 300 hitter. Just managing the failure and defining failure really is what it comes down to. You'll see a young lady, she'll struggle the first two at-bats. And you can tell the girls in the lineup, they don't have a real good first at-bat. You can just, you know what, they're done for the day. 
Um, I know, Stacy, you, you've spent some time, and, and I know you're a big proponent, and, and you've been great. And hey, we've got to teach this at the younger level. You know, we, we've spent most of our brain day workshops with the 16 to 18 year olds. Now we have Stacy with us full time, and hey, we got to get get got to get this information to the 10 and, and 12 year olds. How do you even start getting the young ladies to understand and defining what failure is, and this whole process versus result-oriented thinking? What's a good starting point? Some of the parents and coaches that are coaching the 10- and 12-year-olds, what's a good starting point for them? Honestly, I think trying to just sit down and talk to the athletes, find out what's going through their mind when they fail during an at-bat. Okay, what's, the, what's their thought process when they get back into the dugout? Are they thinking about that next at bat? Are they thinking about you know the next half inning when they have to go back on defense? Or are they thinking, oh man, you know I, I just struck out or I swung at a pitch I shouldn't have? Or just to try to figure out what's going on in their head when they do fail. And, and, I, how- I, and I, I think that's something you're right that d- isn't done enough. In, instead of commenting or criticizing about stride length, stride direction, hip rotation velocity, elbow flexion, posture setup, all the crap. That really doesn't matter because at the end of the day, and, and we've said this before, Howard Johnson was here a few weeks ago, hey, take that swing that's not very good and just be on time. Or I'm a big fan of, I don't care how bad the swing is, pitch recognition. Get a good ball to hit and take your below average swing and put it in play. And especially with the weapons that these girls use now called bats, you don't need to be biomechanically perfect. You just need to be on time. And that's a good point. Coaches need to spend more time having a dialogue with their players, right? Not a monologue, not telling them what went wrong, but starting it with a question. Walk me through, walk me through that at bat. How was your preparation? A lot of times on deck preparation, right? Has a lot to do with their ability to stay with what we call stay with their plan. Do they have a mechanical checklist? We spend time, I know tonight, we'll we'll see our older girls tonight, Stacey, right? Trying to build a routine that the last thing that they're going to do, they're either going to play the piano, which is our way of getting them to get off and not have that bat too tight, or they get to show us the Manny Ramirez, Jessica Mendoza uh, elephant trunks. Will we see a diaphragm breath right before the pitcher toes the rubber? Those are all the things that some say, Rick, well, you know what? That's that's baloney, Tony. That, that's just that's mumble jumble stuff. You can't teach that stuff. Tony, you're dead on. You just I, I kind of just made a face to you because if my girls are listening right now, we call play the flute. And uh, Tony, who's the player with the Boston Red Sox? Euclid. How do you pronounce his last Kevin name? Kevin Euclid. Well, he even noticed that grip on top is that basically he's an advance for me playing the flute. And I watched him and I was listening to a uh, Tony Gwynn talk about the top hand, you know, and first and casting outside. And we're talking a little hitting now, but. We, and if my girls are listening today, I'm glad you said it. You nailed it. I call it play the flute. Let's relax and just get in the box. Hit it and rip it. Front foot down, hands back, and attack the ball. I think as a coach, you know, let's talk about um, pressure again, a mental part of the game. I think on the travel level, which we're talking about today, I think the problem, how many times have you seen a club coach, you had a local, you had a tournament on a week in a showcase or an elimination tournament, and the coach kind of gets on a player a little bit and gets a little loud with them and coaches them up and really doesn't explain to them what they did right or wrong. I think the problem when, on the coaching level today that we have, Stacey brings up some good point about sitting them down and talking to them about the mental approach to the game. I think a coach on our level, me included, we have to understand what it's going to take to get it done. Like we know how to coach every position you should. Myself, I can't teach pitching, but I can teach everything else. I'm comfortable communicating that. I need to understand the mental approach to the game. And for me, Again, back to what we're talking about, whether it's hitting. For me, today, the kids have so much pressure on it. It's all about failure and how we come back. We're not going to, I tell my girls we're not going to win every game. If you hustle and play hard, we're going to compete. And for me, getting back to your original question about the mental approach to this game and eventually on the next level where it's very important, that's the part that as a club level we have to work on. And I think that's where the better coaches, and you really have to define coaching, Stacy. Being the master teacher is different than managing the game. And we mentioned before, Rick and I were talking this morning, and you hear it all the time, daddy ball. Okay, or mommy ball. There's some lunatic mothers out there, too, now sitting on buckets. It's just not all about the dads. Let's not kill the dads. Knowing when it's time to teach and, and knowing when it's time to, to not. Um, Tim Walton talked about, hey, you know what? We need to train and practice hard so the game is easy. And, and, and what, a, what a great, simple, yet very complex term that is. And as coaches, as teachers, it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, I, I think sometimes you're right, Rick. We do forget how hard the game is. 
And as much as we think that we're actually helping that pitcher in, in talking mechanics or, or giving her information that, that's really just overloading her system, when do we just simply leave them alone, right? And, and, and go back and either wait for a teaching moment after the game or between and at bat. Stacy, I know when you played, right, and you played with one of the best head coaches up at, up at Ithaca um, and even at the travel ball level, did you at times have coaches that you wanted to just simply call timeout step out of the batter's box and say, can you shut up, please? I need to bat here. Um, yeah, there, there were times. Um, but I think it, part of it has to do with how well the coaches know the players. And sometimes there are players that, that need that, that need that, you know, step out of the box and give me, you know, give me that cue. Tell me what it is I did wrong, where some players just leave me alone. I want to figure it out myself. So I, I think it has to do with how well your coaches know the players as well. We're going to talk about the nuances and the challenges of coaching the female athlete. This is Tony Abatini with Rick Way and Stacy Pelez on Game On. We're back talking travel softball with Rick Way from the Newtown Rocks 18 Gold team and Stacy Pelez, the new director of softball operations at Frozen Ropes in Chester, New York. Stacy, we'll talk and ask you first, you being the only female uh, in the room right now, dealing with female athletes. Uh, obviously, it's a different dynamics, you being a female, working with the female athletes. Rick and I, I think, have the kind of an additional challenge in, in trying to work, interact, and, and, and get them to perform at a level that they're going to feel good, but some advice that you could give some of the coaches out there um, who are not female. What Are there any differences? Are girls a little different than the boys? Girls are definitely different than the boys. Um, and again, it just goes back to what I said earlier about coaches have to know the individual player. You know, you got to know if one of your athletes can handle being a little bit harsher, not harsher, but just kind of jumping on them, whereas maybe another athlete needs a little bit more um just not not jumping on them a little bit more tlc a little bit yeah. more hugs yeah yeah a little more tlc um but uh yeah coaching girls is definitely different than coaching the boys um but like i said it's just it, it goes back to knowing them knowing how to talk to them the tone that you talk to them in um the timing of when when do you when do you teach them and when do you just let them kind of maybe work through it on their own. Some athletes prefer it if they can just work, work through it on their own. Some girls prefer it if they actually have their coach there, you know, telling them exactly what they're doing wrong. So I think it really does depend on the girl and getting to know the athletes as individuals as opposed to assuming that all female athletes are the same, they're gonna be responding in the same way. So just knowing that there are differences within I'm going to chime in, and, and having spent most of my playing time and, and coaching time on the boys' side, you know, over the last four or five years, and, and people laugh all of a sudden. Frozen Ropes was about baseball for 20 years, and all of a sudden, um, you know, four or five years ago, we we say we're going to jump into the softball world, probably at the same time in which my daughter decided to go and get out of little league. Coincidentally. Female athletes, and, and I'm generalizing and will probably get criticized for this, they are more of their own worst enemy than the boys. They, they become so critical at times and, and lose confidence, again, just in my opinion, I could be way off, than their male counterparts. And I don't know why that is. Is it societal? Is it family upbringing? Um, but, Rick, I don't know. You, you're, you're around a lot of really good players, right? And in our Brain Day workshops, we talk about the enemy list. And, and I think number three on the enemy list is, I am my own worst enemy, okay? I, I, I will criticize, I will find things wrong with me before I can find positive things. From, from your perspective, am I way off in that conclusion? You're 100% right, Tony. Um, when we came in here before, Stacy had to, um, I found that I coached uh, 24 years, and I think, Stacy, you <laughs> said you were one when I started to coach. Um, and one of the things, Tony, we talk about, learning never stops as far as a coach. And, and what I remembered, I mean, I was young when I was started in the early days. Today, I, I don't think I'd have kids play for me today because I was much different back then. I was really tough to play for, very disciplined, very over the top, to be honest with you. Dynamite teams, 
top 10 teams, never enjoyed it. I never, I never, and I made a decision when I came back that I had to change in coaching because I had to remember it's a female sport, it's a girl's sport, it's a woman's sport. And I had the privilege of coaching an All-American at LSU. Her name was Killian Rossner. Coached her at 14 and under. We were top 10 in the country that year with the uh, Northampton Rebels. Killian um, coached at uh, Memphis, and now she's currently at Southeast Missouri State and um, out of Manasquan, New Jersey. And one of the smartest things I ever did, besides getting out of the sport and reassessing what I was doing right and wrong, taking an honest personal inventory of, yeah, you had all this, you may have had success on that year level, but you didn't enjoy it. And I didn't enjoy it because I think I was, I did not approach the girls in the right way, where it was fun. You can win and have fun. You can be disciplined and have fun. And what Killian taught me, being a female and being an All-American, she taught me how to coach. I brought Killian back three years ago. Now it's going on the third year. And she taught me, like she said, Mr. Way, they know what they did wrong. You don't have to tell them. And she taught me how to approach the female athlete of today. Things have changed. Sometimes you talk too much. So they know. We, we call them bucket talks at the end of a game where we get together and sit with the young ladies and rehash things. She taught me when and where, when it was right, when it was wrong. And she taught me a lot about the female athlete. They're tough on themselves. I don't have to remind them. And she gave me balance. And it was one of the smartest things I ever did was bringing her on. And she's one of the finest coaches I have ever met. And that's also moved me in the direction of bringing more female ex-athletes on my staff. So I learned from them how to handle the, the athletes from 1980, Tony, 1990 to today are different. Girls have options. They can do a lot of different things and play softball. you got to keep them in the sport. So I learned that with failure and success, the female athlete today has changed, and I had to change. Am I an easier coach to play for? I'd have to say probably yes. Is a discipline and structure there about commitment? Yes. But I've learned to balance when's the right time to talk to them. And just like Stacy talked about before, when the batter's box get between the way, if, they're, if you're on, it depends on the athlete you're talking to. Everybody's different. But killing and bringing a female athlete who played the game at a very high level taught me how to approach a female athlete, and that's important. I, I think you're right. I, I would just add that br bring on the right female athlete to be around the team. I, I've seen teams just simply yeah. find a female, no disrespect to Stacy, who is female. Um, you need the right female. And, and that's not to say that the men um, cannot teach mental skills training. That does not mean that the male coaches uh, cannot motivate um, and, and get girls to play. But th certainly having a female uh, who knows the game uh, and is the master teacher, that's really the best of the best. Here's the one thing, and, and on an aside, what's with this uniform stuff? Okay, th this really ha has, I find it so funny. You can give guys a burlap bag to wear, okay, and, and sneakers that don't fit, let's get after it. And, and I've learned, the last three years have been a, a major revelation Cardinal versus maroon colors. We have to wear black when we wear this color. We have to have this color in the hair. Stacy, what is up with that? Right? At some point, go play. Who cares what you look like? Is that a female thing? Can you give us some perspective on this, please? Well, I'm just going to make a note and let you know that I have no idea what the difference between cardinal and maroon is. <laughs> so maybe I'm not in that category of everything has to match. Um, I mean, I know in college it's very uniformed, you know, but... As far as you know, your your question on what's it all about? Were you like that when, no. when you were young? <laughs> right? I don't even like I said I don't know the difference between cardinal and maroon. So I, I think know. it's important. And we asked we asked Tim Walton, Rick, you know that girls sometimes will play better if they feel better, and oh, and, and, so and I get that. Okay, and so and fun. I think that that's made all of us better softball coaches at, at Frozen Ropes. But the the amount of time. And, and I, I've just kind of handed it over to Stacy and others, listening to color coordinating and, and the uniforms and whatnot. Um, I, I think it's kind of gets back to if they feel good. And, and for a while it was, you, you know what, I don't care about what you want to wear. But you know what, I, I guess you can teach the old dog new tricks. Now it's let's have this big discussion. Let's make them feel good about it and let them pick out what they want to wear. And I'm sure it's no different in the teams you've coached. Uh, you watch Coach Walton's teams in Florida. If you watch them on TV, they have all the same the hair pieces going on, all the same colors, and yep. they're all the same length. And I'm sure somebody got assigned to buy them for the weekend. Um, it's very common. Our team, we were at the uh, Ronald McDonald tournament in Houston, and one of our my parents went out and purchased. It was a pink tournament, and they went out and bought all these pink, you know, items for their hair, and the whole team wore them. And you know, it's a it's it's Tony, it, it, it is what it is, and uh, it's common. I mean, today it's different. It's just, 
and, and they feel good, they're going to play good. And they loved it. They had, took team photos. They enjoyed it. It's all about, you know, it's what they want to do today. Let's segue over to out of uniforms. Let's talk strain training. I, I know this is something that Stacy and I, really over the last two or three years, we have restructured our strength and conditioning program like like most not to wear the typical travel organization because our world is not travel teams our world is player development and and we train more girls who don't play for us than do play for us um and, and the need for them to understand that strain training is not running around or jogging strain training is not doing push-ups strain training is, is not throwing a medicine ball up against a wall every other wednesday that for so many of them, and you really see it at the college level, that if you're going to play at a Division I program, if you're going to play at any level, whether it's Ithaca College or the University of Florida, there will be some level of strength program. And the sooner the girls realize that this is going to be a part of their college softball program, they're going to be better for it. And we've also seen, Stacy, maybe you can address this, you can talk hitting technique till you're blue in the face. And you can talk about throwing mechanics till you're blue in the face. If you don't address flexibility, range of motion, frozen hamstrings, problems in the scapulas, you're not going to throw any better. And I think once we've made the strength program more important than the technique itself, girls are getting better. No, I, I definitely agree with that. But um, I think one of the things that a lot of the female athletes think with the strength training and some of the fears that they have, they don't want to get bigger. They're afraid that if they get bigger, they're not going to be feminine. And I know that that's an issue even with some of the girls I played with in college. They didn't want to strength train. They didn't want to lift weights. They didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to do that because they were afraid they were going to get big. All right. And, I'm going to, I want to address that. Yes. That's baloney. And I'll give you my theory. Um, okay. You hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you two. I'm going to give you two. And I'll even put you in there. Okay. How tall are you? Five seven. You're five seven and you're strong. Did you did did you lift? Mm -hmm. Did you did you get a chance to go to the prom? Did you get so big that you look like a linebacker? I don't think so. Okay, I'll give you two more names: Jessica Mendoza and Casey Clark. Right? Those are the people in the audience who don't know who. Everyone knows Jessica Mendoza. All right? Jessica Mendoza at about five nine, five ten. You look at her back. You look at her shoulders. You look at her bicep, triceps. She's strong. She probably would still look pretty good in a prom dress. Casey Clark. Five foot five dynamo that'll kick your ass, excuse me, okay, if need to. She's stronger than half the boys. You hear that all the time from the girls? Yes, you're right. If you take creatine and you're bench pressing 290, you're going to have problems going to the prom. But guess what? For so many of the other girls that don't do it, they're lazy, okay? You hear that all the time. I don't want to look like the boys. No, you're just lazy because it's hard work to get stronger. And our RockFit program that, that we have here, you're seeing girls, not mentioning any names they're getting stronger and yet they're gaining weight but you know what you can't even tell that they're gaining weight because their muscle mass is getting better for the first time they have triceps you want to throw harder that's the one muscle in particular that you have to get stronger and i hear that all the time and i don't mean to jump you no, by no, any okay. means I'm... but but i think as coaches we need to start educating some of these girls you will not play at the next level whether that next level is making a varsity team if you don't start getting stronger because technique alone is not going to be enough Rick, your thoughts? Major separation, the physical approach to the game. We were talking um, earlier about two players. Currently, my team, we're looking at two players. I'll be honest with you, Tony, the reason why I'm looking for them is the physical size. There's a major separation right now. On a team that I graduated 11 Division One players last year, when I want to compete nationally, there is a major separation of the physical presence when I go up against some of these teams. It's not ability, it's the physical presence. I had a, recently got together during the holidays and brought the team back that left literally 120 days ago. It looks like a whole different team I never coached. Bigger, stronger, it's a whole different player. And my other, my current team sat in a table right next to them and I, I almost, I, 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 we are in trouble because that team that's 120 days from prior from playing with me, just back from college, it's a whole right. different team. There is major separation on the national level. It's physical presence. But when you advance, we talked about travel teams earlier on, 1300 and whatnot. When I had Van Brekel, who lived four hours away, I could only train on Sundays. I couldn't, I couldn't practice every day during the week. I had to rely on my girls to work during the week. A facility that you have here, they're training outside the game. I can tell at every practice when a young player is not training on their own outside the game, it's about effort and commitment. I can see it. That's why I'm in my, right now on my team, I need, we need stronger. I, I can't compete nationally unless I get bigger and stronger right now. We got the ability. We don't have the physical presence. You need to bring your girls up for a weekend of rock fit. 
And I I'll, wanted to I'll ask you, you, what, can I ask you what you do. Well, I, I, if I if I told you, I'd have to kill you. Okay, <laughs> it, it's top secret. Um, we basically took CrossFit, CrossFit, which is the kind of the the all encompassing workout that's out there. In, in the one hour that the girls come in and and do the RockFit classes, we're strength training, we're speed training, we're anaerobically training, we're flexibility training, we're meditating. In, in a very high impact and extremely quick reaction, go to one thing to the other. Every day, it's a different workout, so the human body isn't getting used to the same old, same old, like the machines and the gymnastic moves are going on. It, it's a very different workout. And how does it segue back to getting better? There's no question. We're seeing girls bench pressing for the first time. If, if you're going to be competitive in softball, you need to squat. You need to, you need to take the four Olympic moves and lift. You need to deadlift. You should be able to do dips. Um, the girls this afternoon at the Rockford class, you're going to see them actually carrying truck tires. Um, they're going to be moving chains, right, and actually doing a chain workout over and over again. They're going to be taking 80-pound ropes and oscillating them back and forth to hit the rotator cuff, cuff muscles. And what we're seeing, right, and, and Stacy's just with us for the last two months now, those girls have a bigger and higher confidence level. That if they think that they're stronger than their opponent, they're going to play better. But at the end of the day, you're standing out on that field in a uniform, and you know, you know what? I didn't really do much preparation. I'm not as strong as that second baseman standing over there. That's a mindset that eventually is going to hamper performance. And so we've attacked the mental game a little differently. We're going to get you stronger. And you standing out on that field knowing that you outworked in the weight room, the other girls on your high school team, you're going to be a better player. Why don't we have all the girls doing that, Stacy? Because they think they're going to get bigger, or they say that to us. And, and that's been, I think, the challenge. You, you've seen mm -hmm. some of the girls on our older team. They're there every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, just for strength training. That's it. They, they know, all right, I'm going to work on my swing. Team practice is not skill-based training. Team practice is to work on team chemistry, double plays, cuts, your relays, your first and thirds. That is not the time to be working on strength and conditioning and even your hitting and throwing. That's the big difference, understanding that. And I think sometimes girls, sometimes Rick, realize it, it's too late. Well, I've been going to practice three times a week. Well, you did. But practice isn't the time to work on these individual skills. I totally agree. And I'm going to um, I want to ask Stacy a question. But I want to tell you, look at the team that I currently have. And a lot of travel teams have kids from, like, I have players from New Jersey. I have players from Pennsylvania. And some live in Pennsylvania three or four hours away. The last thing I want to do, Tony, when I get together on a Sunday is run a fitness training session when I got them for four hours a week. They have to commit outside the game to train. My question for Stacy, getting her opinion, she recently played ball on the, on, the, um, on the high level. How often, let's say a player who plays for me, who can, we only get together for a four-hour session on a weekend where we cover all situational. For me, it's all game training, prep, hitting, and whatnot. How often should they train on their own when they're not with me, just on the physical side of the game? From my experience in college, um, we were going, you know, four days a week. Um, and just to make sure that we were doing it, we, two of them were as a team, and the other two were on our own. And, I mean, so we know that we're doing these two as a team. If we're not doing those other two on our own, it, it's going to show. And as a result, you know, you, you're not going to perform well. You, you're, you're letting yourself down. You're letting your team down. You're letting your coaches down. So it's a sense of accountability as well. I think it also gets back to what are you looking to get out of the game of softball? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's sometimes when we'll sit down and talk to a parent that the college-bound program that, that we now have that, that Stacy oversees, the parent wants the, the, the daughter to go play college. And their expectations on what level is very different from the young lady who just says, you know what? I want to go to a Division three program and be a nurse. I, I, I can't spend five hours a day getting ready to play softball because I really want to be a nurse. And, and so I, I think, you know, if I can also answer the question, Rick, what exactly are you looking to get out of it? If you're sitting down and you're playing on a high-level softball program and you're convinced that you can play in the Big East or the Patriot Conference or in the Ivies, you're going to need to probably work at least three times a week independent of that team practice. You want to go play in the SEC or the Pac-10 or the Big Ten? Um, that's probably a five-day week, five day a week commitment. Not four hours a day, but you better find an hour and a half to strength train, 
to work on your hitting, work on your throwing, work on your speed. We'll talk about speed in a little and, and, and why we've got a generation of girls that can't run, that any time, oh, my God, that, that girl can run, she unfortunately is, is the exception, that we just don't have a lot of girls that run really fast, which is a function of strength training, because Stacy, who has seen a little bit of our turn and burn, we have a speed school at our locations now. I went and looked at the Parisis and the Velocities, and we brought all the track coaches in, and we put everything in a big basket and said, no, no, stupid, good, great, integrate it, and we launched Turn and Burn two years ago. And it's a 50-minute class that, um, even if you're really, really slow, Stacy, were you really fast in college? I was a catcher. I bet you we could have made you <laughs> faster, okay? Quick. Okay, <laughs> you, you were quick. It's something that no one works on, okay? You tell girls you need to be faster. And again, we're not knocking travel coaches because, as Rick said, you got them once a week, right? This is a responsibility for the parents um, and even the high school coaches sometimes who have the girls more than the travel coaches to, to at least address some of the deficiencies. But strength and conditioning... And certainly the speed component, everybody wants girls to run faster. Everybody wants girls to hit the ball further. Well, if you're hitting it further, you need to be a little stronger. And I I think that's where sitting down with each girl, as Stacy has done, let's define your goals. I want to make a high school team. If that's all that you want to do, show up once a week. Because we know we're not knocking high school coaches. You know, high school ball typically is a little less in this part of the country than the level of talent at the travel ball level. So what exactly do you want? You've got some girls, Rick, that play for you that want to go to the top of the food chain. Yeah, five days a week. You better find something to do if you love it. And, and that always gets back to if you truly enjoy it. We see girls that come in sometimes and it looks like, they're just they just they're it's judgment day it's like somebody dragged them out and they have to go out and train if you don't love to train Jessica mendoza when she was here last week or last month excuse me last year just talked about the joy in sweating the the need to love to be in great shape if that need and passion to train isn't there you're not going to play at a higher level no i totally agree tony you know it's uh for me and on um on our level right now it's you can see it when I got a player who's been absent, we, we go a week at a time. I can see who's working outside the game. It's clear. You know, another thing too, Stacy. I have a, I have some players, and you know, I, we call it playing attractive on the recruiting side. I know we're going to talk about recruiting later. And for me, it's the what we talked about earlier about the appearance, whether the colors match or the ribbons and whatnot. But for me, sometimes my girls and speed. I recently had a player who guessed it for me in the, the Southeast Conference School was looking at her, and I have said to the coach, waist down, she's brilliant. Waist up, we got work to do. But waist down, she's brilliant because she has speed. She's got that innate gift that she can run. Some of my girls have a tendency to get overweight, okay? And it, and it hurts them, and they don't understand. It's a difficult it's a difficult thing with fitness. You try to, during the week, what are you working on yourself to get better? And if we have a weight issue which is going to hamper your game, you were a catcher, Stacey, you obviously look like an athlete, you're fit. That helps you compete. That helps you compete. And I think by competing at this level, and, and working out, it's a, it's, a, it's a whole mindset that you have to do. And sometimes, Tony, I tell a parent, listen, I think your daughter needs those 10 or 15 pounds. I, well, you better be careful, Rick. Careful about what? It's your future. I'm trying to help you. This is something we want to help you to compete, work out, and train. And it's part of the game. We're talking travel softball with Rick Way and Stacy Pelez, recruiting the do's, the don'ts, and all the problems that go on with it. We're back with the Rick and Stacy show. Before we send it back to recruiting and whatnot, Stacy, I have a question about motivation. Do we really believe as parents that we can actually motivate teenage athletes? I, I want your perspective on that. I, I know I have a very different perspective on it, but how would one, whether it's a coach, whether it's a parent, how do you motivate that 15-year-old girl to, whether it's strength train, lose weight, be a better player, love the game more. How do you motivate teenagers, in your opinion? Tough question. I'm putting you on the spot, but that's okay. That's why you're the best. Um, I'm actually going to go with that nutritional piece, to be honest. Um, I think with that part of it, with female athletes, I think that there needs to be education within the, you know, each program to let the athletes know, you know, doing the training and then eating whatever you want, it's, it's counterproductive. So, having a, a balance of 
training, you know, strength training, conditioning, along with, you know, proper nutrition is extremely important. Um, so as far as that goes, I think that providing them with the education, the knowledge they need, because some of them might might not know. It was interesting. One of our main uh, sponsors, ShopRite, and, and because of them, we have the opportunity to sit here and, and, and talk about softball. We had their uh, their sport, their nutritionist, Rick, on a almost on a every few months. She'll come in and talk to the girls, cook for the girls, explain to them pregame, in game, post game. Really understanding. It's not about losing weight. It's about eating properly. I think just educating young girls on you can lose weight and you can do it very easily if you want to by making better food choices. Putting the nutritional part away, though, can you motivate 14-year-olds? Can, can you as a parent will your daughter to go to the weight room? Can, can you motivate them with some magic words or secret potion to go into the basement and hit off the tee every night, Stace? I, I do. Um, I also think it has to do with um, how much do the parents want to motivate their child. Um, I think I don't think that all of it should be put on the parent trying to motivate them, but at the same time, you, you can't expect an athlete to, I, I guess you can, um, providing support for the athletes as a parent, as a coach, as you know, I think that's really important. That definitely is motivation. I know for myself, I had extremely supportive parents, and that, you know, was just one piece of why I continued with sports. You know, aside from the fact that I love doing it, so I think support is a really big motivational factor, and being able to see the benefits of sports, uh, softball specifically, right now, seeing what the, you know, set a goal. Okay, small goals at a time. You can't set unrealistic goals. Set something that's attainable. Okay, sitting down with your with your child and say, okay, in the next three months, what do you want to achieve? What do you want to get out of your training program? What do you want to get out of you know the softball program? Okay, after three months, find out did they reach that goal? Okay, set another goal. Don't set things for you know don't set unrealistic goals with the athletes. Set something that's that they can reach because if they set something if they set a goal that's just out of this world ridiculous in the next three months and they don't reach it, well, they're just going to shut down. I agree with almost everything that you said. Almost everything. Oh, but what? <laughs> Parents need to support. Coaches need to provide opportunities. But at the end of the day, here's my opinion. By the time they're 13, the best and only motivation is self-motivation. Mm -hmm. You are not going to will that girl to do the things that she needs to do to play. You can, you again, supportive encouraged there's some times in which maybe your your son or daughter might not want to go to practice hey come on you know what it's part of the team commitment that's encouraging but where where i i struggle with parents sometimes and and knock heads you know what i'm going to will my daughter to go play at the highest level we can get away with that as parents you're a little bit too young stacy you don't know little ones at home yet no okay rick and i are the dinosaurs in the room we have children okay and at about 9 10 or 11 or 12 Okay, I'm the center of their universe. I can tell my daughter, Michaela, and my son, Anthony, this is what we're doing. This is what you're going to do, and I'm going to motivate you to clean that room. I'm going to motivate you to get outside, and I'm going to motivate you to get good grades. And then something happens it's called the teenage years. They get to be 13, 14 years old. And, yes, there is still discipline in, in, in my house, and there are still some rules, but I'm not going to motivate or will my two children to do things that they don't want to do outside of what they have to do. Rick, you uh, feel free to disagree, but I I've said it before, and, and my kids laugh at me. Right, Tony, motivate us. Yeah, I'm going to motivate you. You know what? Motivation is over. Self-motivation is the only long-term and genuine motivation if you're going to be a tremendous athlete or a tremendous person. I can guarantee you, Jessica Mendoza never needed encouragement to go to the gym. It's a special kind of athlete that's fully committed, and I think today... Let me, let me bounce this off you, Tony. Um, we, I just did a recruiting clinic about two weeks ago up in Connecticut. One of my focus, and I talked about a player I had at a top program. Let's talk about motivation and commitment. If that player is getting recruited today at a nice, a nice uh, program, wants to continue to play softball, right now a parent will have, not have a difficult time to ask that player to go to the gym or try to do everything they can to work hard and continue to work hard, whether it's in the classroom, fitness, training. They'll do it. For me as a parent, you need to encourage 
let's, let's, how are we going to get that athlete after they've committed to that university, got a year and a half left, they're already advancing on to college in their mind, they're still got to play high school ball, still got to play travel ball. The real challenge is how do we get that teenage player to the gym after they've actually achieved everything they wanted to achieve because they think they've reached their goal. And for me, we talked about how it changed in the club ball, how it's changed for me, how I was a different coach in the late 80s, early 90s. Discipline, high intensity, almost, uh, I think, counterproductive as far as encouragement. What I've tried to do with my players is encourage them to do this. I used to force them in the 90s. Today, I encourage them. They have to be self-motivated on their own to get it done. And that's the bottom line. The athletes of today, there's too many good athletes. I think we talk about players of the 80s and 90s. Pitching was better back when I started, guaranteed. Better than the pitchers we have today. Bottom line, better. The athletes are better today. Separation comes if your commitment to the game is there and you train on your own. I, I couldn't have I couldn't have said it any better. Although I think I I you and I agree, right? Stacy disagrees. Stacy thinks because she's young, she thinks she's going to motivate those fourteen year old brats one day. God bless her. Maybe she'll be able to do it. But on a serious note, it really gets back to what's the end game? If the end game is to be the best player on your JV or varsity high school team, then then your commitment level is X. And that's okay, because at the end of the day, these girls are not making a living doing this, with with some exceptions. And, you know, playing in the NPF, the National Fast Pitch League, you're not going to make big dollars to do this as, as a career. You can mention or you can list the amount of girls that do this at a level, the Jessica Mendoza's, the Jenny Finch's, the Lisa Fernandez's back in the days that can do this full time, what are you looking to get out of it? And, and at the same time, don't you dare, little girl, say that you want to go play for a Wally King at Syracuse or a Bill Edwards in Hofstra and not put the time in because you're lying to yourself. You need to learn how to self-motivate yourself. And if you can't do that, then those goals and expectations are unreal. Let's segue out. We've got about five minutes left. Um, we talk about years of experience between Rick and, and Stacy, both as a player and as a coach, and, and now overseeing our college-bound program at Frozen Ropes Recruiting. Um, Rick, if you can, some of the classic mistakes that, that you've seen parents and players themselves make over the years. If you had to identify one or two that at the end of the day, they're a senior now, and the parent or player said, boy, you know what? I wish I would have listened to Coach Way and done it a different way. What are some of the things that you've seen in the past where a parent says, I made a mistake in this whole journey called college recruiting? Honesty and self-assessment is key right up front. you got to be honest. I think the, the athletes of today and the parents at times are afraid to hear the truth. What I've done today and I've learned is I'm direct. I get to, so the other day I had a list of 10 schools. One of my young ladies, says 2014, and she sends me, she had Notre Dame, Arkansas, all these monster programs. Well, she'll never play at. 10 years ago, put my arm around her, take my time. Now I get right to the point, you'll never play there. And I gotta be honest with you, based on ability, I think the honesty in the recruiting process has to start at home. Where's my daughter? I can't tell you how many times in the recruiting process we're shooting way too high. We need to be balanced and make a balanced decision. Education first. And we hear it all the time. I hear all these recruiters talking about recruiting. When we have teams, you're hands-on. You deal with the real live stuff. This is the kind of kid I have. This is where her niche is. I'm a Northeast coach. I like it in Northeast. I want my kids to go to Northeast. We compete nationally. I feel in my heart my girls belong in the Northeast. If I have a player that commits and wants to play in the Southeast Conference for a Coach Walton, and I think they have the ability, go look. I'm good with that. The key is honesty and self-assessment. And like we talked about, the commitment to the game, if you're not committed – when we're not together as a team, you'll never make it on the next level. That's great insight, Stacy. Can you follow up with that? I mean, some of the some of the mistakes that that you're, you're even seeing now in your capacity is kind of our guidance counselor to a lot of these girls. Um, I think being educated on the programs that you're looking into is really important. You know, um, know the background of the program. Um, you know, know what kind of a program it is. Like, how do they run it? Um, Knowing information about the school, I think a lot of times athletes are too anxious to commit somewhere just to say that, yeah, I'm going to, you know, Big Ten school or, you know, whatever. And I just think that it's really important to read all the literature and, you know, know everything, have everything laid out, whether it be, you know, with, with the counselor, parents, you know, whoever it is, you know, n know exactly what you're getting into. I think you're right. It's probably the single, be single biggest decision that these girls are going to make in, in their young lives. I think you have to start early. I know families that, that we get introduced to many times, well, my daughter's a junior, is it time to be in this program? Well, you should have been in this program two years ago. 
right, to really start understanding where geographically she might want to play at. Um, I know in our college-bound program, it all starts with skill development. The first two years as a freshman and a sophomore, your grades and where you want to go to school aren't even a reality. Let's spend your freshman and sophomore years just maxing out your skill level, and then you'll have more opportunities and you can start taking tours and, and taking trips. Rick and I talked before, if you really want to go to the University of Florida or Alabama, I think the best thing to do with all these universities that have these camps and clinics, go there. If you believe that you're that good, go down to any school. Maybe you're, at, maybe you're on a travel program. You're not playing in the big tournaments. You're not playing on the main fields. Well, okay, that's the reality of life. But if you think you're that good, you proactively get on a plane, save your money, and have your parents go down to those schools. And, and hopefully the college coaches will be honest and say, wow, there's the one diamond in the rough. There's that half of 1% of the girls from the Northeast maybe that can play here. Maybe they'll see something special. Or it, it really will authenticate what Rick just said. You're a Northeast girl because the reality is you're going to go to school, generally speaking, anywhere from three to four hours away from where you live. That statistically, over the last 15 years in the Northeast, if you're going to school in Hudson, New York, you're going to go to school probably three hours from Hudson, New York, right? That's how Stacy wound up in Ithaca College. So I, I think you can do that. I'm looking at the clock. We're, we're running out of time. I can't thank Rick Way enough and Stacy Pelez. Um, we'll have them back very soon, and the three of us will continue to set the bar and raise the bar as it relates to travel softball. <laughs>